Oftentimes, the frustration with understanding Jules Deleuze and Félix Guattari is asking the Lacanian question, what does he want? It becomes difficult to narrow down what exactly is it that Deleuze and Guattari are trying to achieve. What are their end goals? What are they orienting their action towards? In this lecture, I'd like to give a sort of political primer about what it is that Deleuze and Guattari are trying to tell us in terms of politics. It's important to note that Deleuze and Guattari met around May 68. You know, for those who don't know, May 68 is a very important movement where Groups of students around France were starting to loosely organize into movements that were very critical of a number of institutions and traditional ways of thinking, and it had a lot of anarchist tendencies, per se. There was a big distaste for police violence, um, this was around the time of protests of Vietnam and things like this. And it was very peculiar because it was a properly student-led uprising. And it culminated in several months of riots and basically like another French Revolution almost. It was quelled by government force, and it was very controversial at the time, and still is, and it's one of the most important moments in modern French politics and culture in general for establishing the relationship between the state and its citizens. And it had a big impact on Deleuze and Guattari because many other academics at the time, such as Foucault, were interested in the May 68 movement. And, I mean, Foucault, for example, when it was happening, he was teaching in Tunisia, and a friend put the phone up to the radio or whatever so that F Foucault could hear the broadcast going on, and so he could hear about all these protests that he was missing that were, I mean, Foucault probably I can only imagine how much he was he was loving what was going on there and Dules and Guattari saw a lot of revolutionary potential in May 68 and Dules and Guattari are properly political philosophers now they're not your traditional political philosophers for a number of reasons I mean when they met, Guattari was very much involved in politics and was a little bit more inflammatory. He had this special mental institution that he had been running, this kind of psychiatric institution, which was part of the anti-psychiatry movement, he was focused on changing it, and... Does was basically restricted to being an academic. Now, they're not your traditional political philosophers because they're not your traditional moralist types. They're more like Nietzsche in this way. They are asking for a revaluation or transvaluation of all values. They want to focus on politics as a method of collective action, not as searching for some fundamental institutions to establish, necessarily. 
but more so they are concerned with creative rhizomatic action that is going to escape totalization. And for them, totalization is probably in the most dangerous form of violence. They are deeply anti-fascist because of this. They're concerned with resisting subjectification and being reduced. And in order to do this, they're focused on not abandoning any order just haphazardly. They are not needlessly avant-garde or just oriented towards needless counterculture movements, but rather they're focused on operating within the order of things and analyzing it and attacking it viciously at the angles, not for the purposes of reaching some sort of ideal order, but by using the becoming of various institutions and ideas as the momentum that allows one to exercise one's agency. Because, like they mention several times throughout A Thousand Plateaus, in things like a plebiscite, you know, where you are, where you're voting, the asking of the question already elicits the answer. When you are asked in a plebiscite, would you like to vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden? One could well respond in a schizophrenic manner to a ballot and say, is this all? Or I vote for neither or I vote for both. And we could analyze whether or not these responses are actually a breath of fresh air or not or needlessly countercultural because one could say that oh, merely saying you want both is just falling, you know, falling wholesale for your lack of agency or whatever. But to listen to Atari's point is that the way certain questions are framed and the way you are oriented as a subject politically necessarily entails certain modes of behavior and action and... This is structured by the state apparatus in things like order words. And these would be words like, you are guilty. Like these kind of phrases that orient you as a subject in relation to other subjects and in relation to a hierarchicalized order. And because of this, they think that agency is necessarily a social process. They talk about collective assemblages of enunciation several times. And because of this, because they view any individual association as necessarily a social relation to other things... Every supposedly individual statement is actually a very rich statement in relationship to a whole set of factors that are orienting one as a linguistic subject, for example. Um, The difference between sense as opposed to nonsense, for example, and what actually is allowed to make sense. To get an idea for these kind of collective assemblages, think of when one speaks of or implicates an iPhone. This entails bringing to mind a number of ways in which the iPhone functions in relation to various other objects and ideas. You think of Apple as this immense corporation. You necessarily, to think of Apple are going to be thinking of Samsung as a rival competitor. When one thinks about the iPhone, you think of the consumer trends involved with kind of the, you know, cycles of when the iPhone is coming out. You think of the social status involved with ritually purchasing the iPhone compared to the Samsung. You know, you kind of think of the 
the almost memeable difference between iPhone and Samsung users. Um, you think of past versions of the iPhone, all of this other stuff, which takes something as simple as an object like the iPhone and gives it a radiating solar system model around it where objects are not impotent you know, compared to subjects, but rather they're orienting themselves in a sort of flat ontology where everything is essentially object-oriented, kind of like Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology. Objects and subjects all have political implications. Every action is political for them. Every action as a statement and every statement as an action is involved politically in an order and has the potential, whether it's an utterance or an action kind of more broadly, or whether it's an institution, all is going to have political implications for them. And really their focus in politics is on creativity and in order to be creative, they use the model of the schizophrenic. For example, in their two-work series, they did together Capitalism and Schizophrenia, which is Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus. One may ponder that title for a while, but the point is to juxtapose and relate to one another capitalism and schizophrenia. And they critique the capitalistic way of of acting for a number of reasons, one of which being that it is essentially an apparatus of capture, so to speak. It is going to involve establishing this sort of solar system model which radiates outward in which, yes, creative action takes place, innovation occurs. But it's not for innovation's purpose necessarily or it's not to establish new orders but rather to expand almost unnecessarily and ad nauseum and ad infinitum the reign of capital in this expanding circle model where it's not rhizomatic or schizophrenic but rather it escapes boundaries precisely to realize everything within the boundary of its relation to capital. So, I mean, capitalism has to, for example, assume that you can continually extract surplus value and reduce wages in order to be able to continue to compete in a market. And as such, it's not bound by these set limitations, which Dulles and Guattari think has the potential to be radical. But they think that opposed to this is the schizophrenic, who is defined by not respecting boundaries and making these new and surprising connections. They mention throughout Anti-Oedipus Judge Schraber, and for example, Judge Schraber's solar anus. Or they talk about how Judge Schraber, who is this, he was this uh, patient of Freud's, and he talked about how his stomach would disappear. And then sometimes when he would get really hungry or before meals, his stomach would reappear miraculously. And the point is that for them, the schizophrenic model of action, because they're not they're not advocating that we all become mentally ill necessarily in the literal sense so much as they're using schizophrenia as this model of a breath of fresh air which is to say resisting subjectification it's resisting neutralization under order words or signifiers and it's about resisting this reduction to a molar order. 
It's about resisting being reduced to Oedipus, to the phallus, to capital, to being normal, to being rational, to being neutral in conflicts. For them, to be schizophrenic is to draw lines of flight through territory and not be restricted by, for example, the rule of capital and using innovation as a sort of negative line of flight. Because this is the difference between the creativity, quote-unquote, that is established by capitalism and that that is the result of the schizophrenic mode of action. That innovation for capitalism is always for the purposes of capital. It's for the purposes of profit. It's essentially a negative line of flight is what they call it. It's a relative deterritorialization. It's difference for the sake of being supplanted. Whereas they compare the schizophrenic deterritorialization to being that of an ac- absolute deterritorialization. It doesn't respect these boundaries or these molar principles of organization, but rather is simply going to expand in this mode of creativity. And they use the process of becoming, specifically that of becoming minor, to orient us politically. They want to locate institutions and ideas and objects as members of an assemblage with relations from an idea or an object to another. For example, they want to relate, and these are not specific examples necessarily, but ways in which we could analyze things politically. We could look at the prison apparatus's connection to drug policy. Or we could look at city planning in relation to gradients of racial groups in a population. And the population part is important because they want to perform a population-oriented sort of evolutionary approach to functional fitness within an environment. In order to determine how is it that these semi-stable elements like traditions and institutions relate to their assemblages that they interpenetrate. And then after localizing and orienting these institutions, practices, ideas, they want to send them running as they speak and learn how to be bilingual or multilingual in one's own tongue. They want to bend the rules of the order and draw lines of flight through the boundaries that have been established which allow for order to come about. It does allow for re-territorialization. So every decision and every action is always necessarily going to establish a new order of some kind. But that new order will be unactualizable without leaving its mark and testifying to one's agency. As a result, Deleuze and Guattari's political model is not utopian in the typical sense of establishing an ideal society that is teleologically established in advance. While they are utopian in the sense of they have this utopian model for action, the schizophrenic, it's not about establishing an ideal society in the sense of a fixed point, but rather it's something that's realized in a mode of action, similar to how Nietzsche's Zarathustra speaks of a line stretching over an abyss between man and the Ubermensch. And... Rather than seeking to be the Ubermensch, one seeks to become the Ubermensch, learns to act and live over this void or live on the edge, as Dulles and Guattari say. So their political goal, so to speak, is not the realization of any particular institutions or ideals so much as it is this new method of political action, which is going to accept transience 
and the particularity of actions to a certain situation and speaks as Nietzsche's Zarathustra speaks, let my pride once more go with my folly. I hope this has given you some useful ways of understanding Dules and Guattari and their relation to political philosophy and action, and I'll see you in another lecture.